Eh, ok, let's see. Good afternoon. So we are going to do is combine the slides and blackboard uh, talk now. Let me start by saying that uh, this is some adver advertisement. This is the book we've been using the material for, and it's going to appear next week. So I just got to the publisher. Monday is going to be available, so this is how it looks like. So reflection on advanced mathematics. Uh, the publisher is the European Mathematical Society. Okay, so, so now I want to continue and talk about some, hmm? <laughs> well, is it visible? So nicer pictures for a change, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I thought maybe it's a good idea to give some uh, more clear pictures for the tables. So I want to continue f talking about some applications of this theory and also something which we call universality, which is actually a structural thing. It's, it has some algorithmic uh, implications, but this is a stru structural mathematical statement, which I think is very useful. Uh, so let me start with talking about tables. What is a table? You see it's something like this. We have variables. So the variables are arranged in, uh, in such an array. X, I, J, K is a non-negative integer for every I, J, K. So I goes from 1 to L. J is up to M and K up to N. OK, three indices. This is a three-dimensional table. <clears throat> in general, you can think on a higher dimensional tables. And before I go to talk about optimization, so let me just talk about feasibility, deciding if there is a feasible table. Uh, so we are looking for non-negative integer table. You see each cube, little cube here, is one of these uh, variables, x, i, j, k. So is this clear? And you see it's also a generalization of the standard transportation problem where you just have one matrix one sort of layer. And now there are equations. And the equations could be all sorts of equations. In general, uh, these are called margins, margin equations in statistical applications. And I'm going to look on what is really the most interesting case where things start uh, becoming interesting. This is the case of line sums. So you see I indicated here these green uh, numbers. They, they are the line sums. So I, I look on tables where the sum of the entries in this cube along this line should be 9. So this is an example. 3 plus 5 plus 1 is 9. OK? And the same, this line should sum to 8. This line should sum in 6. But I, I just indicated one line from every direction. And there are many line sums, all of them. So how many are there from this side, like the, like the 9 here? Yeah, maybe I should uh, start if, uh, well, from this side, you know, the 6. For example, the 6 on this side, we have all of those. We have a matrix actually of uh, 18, 3 times 6 line sums, and so on. So this is defined actually by three matrices, which give you the line sums from all the, the direction. And this is an integer program. Now let's just look on the feasible set. So S is the set of all X, I, J, K in Z, L, M, N plus non-negative integer tables, which satisfy such line sums. And so if we sum over the first index, we should have some number, some matrix, so A, J, K. And summing over the second direction, we should equal some number B, I, K. And summing over K, should equal some C, I, J. So this is a feasible set of an integer program, exactly of the standard form we, we have been looking on, non-negative integers and equations. The equations are the line sums. You can have uh, other equations, uh, plane sums. Uh, in higher dimension, you can have various flat hyperplane sums, various sums of flats in all sorts of dimensions, and even much more than that. You know, that doesn't have to be line sums. Uh, you can have some other linear, linear equations here. So <clears throat> let's consider the complexity of this. So what is the complexity of just deciding? I give you as an input this set. I want to know if it's empty or not. So we have L, M, and N are part of the input. And these numbers, the right-hand side, you see, the, you see the laser on the blackboard? 
Yeah. AI, AJK, BIK, and CIJ, these green numbers. And the question is, what is the complexity? And I'm going to consider four situations according to whether some of the sides, LMN, are variable or fixed. So we've seen before that if we fix some of the parameters, then things become doable in polynomial time. So red, whenever I color a parameter in red, it means it is variable. So large and variable part of the input. And if it is blue, it means that this is fixed. So I'm looking on four situations. If all of them are variable, this is the hardest situation. Obviously, that's clear, right? If all of them are fixed, 5 by 5 by 10, it's easier, right? So the complexity should go down as we go down here. So obviously, and the question is, is so some of these are going to be polynomial time decidable, and some are going to be anti-complete to decide, which means there's very, very unlikely to have a polynomial time algorithm. So can you, well, first of all, if something is interesting is going on here, what can you guess about the top and bottom? The hardest and the easiest. So what is the hardest? What's the complexity of the hardest? Should be NP-complete, right? And this indeed is a classical standard NP-complete problem, uh, so-called three-dimensional matching, already in CARP's original 72 paper. If I go up to the bottom one, then, well, it should be polynomial time, but do you see how? So I give you a hint, Matthias' uh, lectures, even though he still did not uh, reach this point, I think. But uh, the theory that Matthias is developing, what, uh, what's happening in this situation? LMN, LMN are fixed. How many entries do we have here? How many variables? L times L times N. L times N times N. So this is fixed. Mm -hmm. This is fixed dimension. Fixed dimension theory, you need Lenster's algorithm or other rational functions or whatever Matthias is talking about. This came 10 years later, the 80s. And this is, a, this is a complicated algorithm. You need this machinery for geometry of numbers and so on. It's not easy. And this just deals with fixed number of entries. So now let's look on the second situation. We have one side fixed. Let's say, I don't know, 10 or even 3 by mn. So suppose this is m, this is n, and l is the number of layers here. If you have just one layer, L equals one, you get a, a matrix. A two-dimensional M by N problem, this is a transportation problem. You can solve it by linear programming because of total linear modularity or by flow algorithms, we've talked about this. Again, it's not trivial, but you can do it. If you have more entries, three and more, if you have two, then this is basically still a two-dimensional problem because if you know one layer, you know the other because you have the line sense from here. So one is determined by the, by the second. So three is the, the first interesting case here, three. And so it turns out, and that's something I want to discuss a little bit more later, is that uh, three by M by N table problems are universal for integer programming. So I'll explain this uh, in, in a second. But uh, before that, so this is something we know for some time now, and. I want to discuss this, but uh, let's just finish this uh, classification. What about the next situation? So two numbers are fixed, L and M, and one is variable. So think now the small ones, like right? this is three, this is four. So suppose this dimension three and four are really three and four fixed. And this, this six here has more. This is N now, N layers. Again, this is not an easy problem because you see, I mean, even if they're all fixed, you need the integer programming in fixed dimensions. This is a harder problem, and it's a problem in a variable number of variables because the number of variables is L times M, which is fixed, times N. So can you guess the answer now? Well, there's a hint. There's one N colored red. On the blackboard, I couldn't color it red, but it, there's N all the time. N-fold. This is an N-fold program. N-fold integer program. This is actually the original paper that we had on this in 2008. So let me uh, explain. Uh, before I go to universality, maybe let's, uh, you don't want another slide go. Ah, yeah. So let me, before I go to talk about universality here, which is really the topic of this uh, hour, 
let me remind you or show you again how does, why is this an n-fold program. So this is, a, in the hour before, I just formulated this transshipment problem, you know, and this was a little bit, uh, a little bit of a mess on the blackboard to do it. But now I want to do it uh, here. So look on this problem, and, and as I'm saying here, it's actually, you can look on arbitrary dimensional tables, so M1 by M2 by some MK by N tables. This is a K plus one dimensional table. So such transportation problems, so-called multi-index transportation problems are classical. They've, they've been uh, first studied by Motsky in already 60 years ago. Uh, without this color, of course, I mean, you had this M1 by M2 by MK. There was no complexity uh, involved then. And now you see, you see how it looks like. So N is this vertical thing, and I'm thinking of layers here. So the variables come naturally in layers, right? So each brick, you remember our notation for the bricks here. So each, the variable, I should arrange them like this, X1, Xn. So each brick, Xk, is actually uh, an array of... Uh, of dimension k, one of these lower dimensional, uh, oh, should keep breaking the chokes. Uh, each one of those small arrays is a brick of variables, L times M variables. So our T, we never used T before, so T now is, uh, yeah, so T is the product of all the others, M2 times mk. This is our t from the n-fold structure. Each brick lies in this in dimension t, and we have uh, n of those. And so uh, and so this is an n-fold program. And why is this an n-fold program? Let's say line sum of this works for any margins, uh, plane sums and other linear functions. So you, the, the claim is you can write down a simple n-fold product which describes these equations over here. And you see the A1, you sum over all the layers. So this corresponds to taking line sum in this vertical direction. These are the equations that come from this part of the system. And the second part of the system is A2, uh, gives you separate equations and the line sums on each layer. One, one, each one has its own equation with the same A2. You see? So, yeah. You're not assuming that these line sums are constant or anything? No, 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 that's part of the input. Right. This is the part of the input. So the, the green B here, you see the vector B, consists of all these given numbers. They are given as a part of your input. And the only thing is that you have to do the same equation in each layer. So if you take all line sums or all plane sums, you are fine. Because they have to repeat for every layer. So tables are uh, such tables you can do in polynomial time if one side is variable. And in application in statistics, somehow it's really often this is the case. You have a large, one side is large. Uh, the number of ages uh, of, of some group of people, individuals, there's some statistics on the health parameters and so on. So some parameters may be, you know, healthy, sick, or uh, below threshold, above threshold, uh, of some, you know, some parameter. And another group may be the, the age group, which may be every year or every two years. So you may have 50 there. So this is, uh, this is n-fold. And, okay, so here is a corollary. We can do non-linear optimization over such tables in polynomial time for every fixed n, and this is a number, variable number of variables. So let me discuss this universality a little bit. So what is this universality? So we have the following theorem. So here is a theorem. Any rational polytope So you will see a lot of uh, a lot about polytope in uh, Matthias's lectures. So a polytope is something like this in standard form again, x r n, a x equals some b, x no negative, and you assume it's it's bounded, so it's a polytope. You know, looks something like this. 
have a such rational polytope, rational is equivalent to having the matrix and the right hand side being ra having rational or integer entries. Every rational polytope is equivalent, is actually identical, isomorphic, or I'll explain exactly what does it mean, uh, to some 3 by m by n line sum polytope. of the form of this form. So some trans multi-index transportation polytope. How about three? It's an answer three. Three by m by n, uh, such that uh, there will be sigma xi jk, you know, line sum equations, line sums, and x is non-negative. I should AIJ, you know, BIJ, C, BJK, whatever, CIK. I mean, these sounds over there. Uh, so, so, do you understand the, the statement roughly, except for what is what does the isomorphic mean here? I'm saying you take any rational polytope, and I can lift it up. Let's call this Y, actually. Let's call this Y. So Y is in the original space. Ah, and this is not N, sorry. So this is D. I start with some polytope in dimension D in variables Y. I can lift it up. So here is RD down here. And up here, you have R3MN. And this embedding is done in such a way that each coordinate of the original space, each yi, simply sits in some xijk, in some table entry, becomes some table entry. And there's a bijection. This polytope up there, the set of all non-negative real tables, this line sum is exactly in bijection with the polytope below. And the polytope that looks exactly the same. They're the same dimension. Everything is the same. And moreover, there's also bijection between integer points. So there's a bijection, there are bijections. Bijection between uh, P and, and T, and P intersected with ZD, and T intersected with Z, C, M, N. The one to one correspondence between the real points, the rational points, the integer points, they're all the same, except that this has this spe special structure. I'll show later, I'll describe it in a different way using n fold notation, which would be much nicer. But I tell you that every, uh, every, so these tables are really universal. So you can, of course, it's empty hard to optimize integer program over such things. And it tells you various nice things. So, for example, the set of equations here. Depend, depends only on the M and N. There's, if you write down the matrix which defines these equations, it depends only on two parameters, M and N. So this is the universality. And I'll, towards the end of this talk, I'll give you notation using N fold, which is much, much more elegant. Much more elegant. Uh, but now I just want to uh, discuss some uh, applications to privacy in databases. And, and I'm going to demonstrate the use of universality in this problem. So, I mean, is this clear? Are you, have you lost me? I mean, if I go back to the complexity. So, you see, I'm, I was talking about this, so uh, universal. So, 3 by n by n tables, any integer programming problem is one of those. So therefore, in particular, it's NP hard, of course, NP complete to the side. Okay, so let me talk about privacy a little bit. So, privacy. So, here's one application. Uh, and I, I want to show also the power of this universality. Uh, so what is uh, the problem of privacy? One problem, I mean, uh, this is a huge area, but this is one simplistic thing that we can do. And there's really there's lot of, there are a lot of more directions to study in this problem. 
It's been studied by various communities, statisticians, computer scientists. Everyone has his own perspective of this. And there's still no clear uh, consensus what's the best way to treat this. But here is one very clear problem. So you have this table with margins. One of those. Oops, I'm going backwards. This is your table. And the table, each entry represents some data on some individuals. There are statistical databases in the Health uh, Institute for National, National Institute for Health Statistics, for example. And then they have this, all these factors, and they have the table. And the tables are available on the internet, on the website. Because the idea is that uh, researchers can use this data. So, for example, if the data measures, I don't know, people with such and such cholesterol levels in their blood, and how much wine do they drink every day, <laughs> And they want to make some correlation. You see all these statistics uh, research things. You know, now it's decided that coffee is good for you. Or now it's wine, red wine is bad for you, or whatever. So, but, you know, some more serious uh, things. So they have these tables. The tables are available on the Internet, in, in their websites. The U.S. Census Bureau, or the Institute for, uh, National Institute for Health Statistics. And you can actually get the tables. But the problem is that somehow they, they are concern that you, that some privacy of some individual will be affected. If you are able to see that in one entry there's a small number, maybe, uh, then you may be able to cross this with some other databases and eventually identify this specific individual in some county which has a specific problem, a rare genetic disease, and then the health insurance company will not give insurance to this person. So this is a serious problem. And so what they do usually, they, they don't really give you the tables in the, on the web, but they give you margins. So they give you partial, you know, just this matrix. So sort so of they lose some of the factors. And then the natural question is, uh, what can happen if in a single entry, can you actually recover this entry just from the margins? So mathematically, the problem is the following, what I call the entry uniqueness problem, a uh, set of values. So the question is the following. Suppose you're looking on such a table of given line sums. Then there's a set of feasible tables. And you can look on the entry, the value of a specific entry under all possible tables with the same line sums. If there's only one possible value, then there's enough information to actually get it. Although computationally, it still may be very hard, maybe NP hard or how, but still, as far as the information goes, if in one entry there's only possible value in all the tables which have the same line sums or the same margin that are released on the web, then uh, one can actually recover this. So there's this issue. And so let me show you that, uh, for example, you can get things like this. The universality of table entries, every finite set of non-negative integers is the set of values in an entry of some uh, table. So I want to just give one demonstration of the use of this universality theorem. I mean, I'm not going to prove it, of course. It's, there's a whole uh, section in, the, in, in, in my monograph on this. But let me just try to illustrate this. So what I'm saying is the following. Every finite set of non-negative integers is the set of values in an entry of the three by n by n tables with some given line sums. Well, maybe I should to make this clear. Let me actually give you the picture. Here's an example. So look on such tables and suppose these green numbers are the line sums from all directions. And now my question is look on all non-negative integer tables, possible tables which have these line sums and look on all possible values that can occur in this uh, shaded entry. I'm saying you can get only zero and two. So there's a gap. You cannot get one. And this is a little bit counterintuitive because somehow you think you may get the whole interval. Uh, so there are only two tables with these line sums. One has a zero here and one has a two. And that's all. And to construct this, well, how do you construct such an example or even more complicated examples? Well, it's very hard to construct it in, a, in an ad hoc fashion. So you can use this universality. So I just want to demonstrate the power of this uh, universality for such and other constructions. So we can actually do more. So as, as it is said up there, you give me now numbers, S1, S2, SK, let's say, some positive integers, non-negative integers. 
And I want to construct, I want to show you. So claim so there are M N and line sums for three by M by N tables. such that uh, the values that a specific entry, let's say x1, 1, 1, attains in all possible tables, in all non-negative integer tables with these line sums, is precisely this, uh, this set of points. So you see the claim? I mean, you understand the claim. And I, I should say, actually, this was very surprising for people that uh, have been working with these tables in, in these agencies. They were really surprised by this. Some of them thought it's always an interval. And then the assumption, their working assumption that if you computes a lower and upper bound using linear programming, and you get, let's say, 5 and 20, and everything in between can occur, and therefore it is fairly safe to release these margins, because there may be 20 values. But actually, you may have only one. So how do you do this? So I want to show you how to do it with universality. So it's, you see, uh, my goal is to find these green numbers, these line sums, so that this is the case. So this shaded entry has exactly the values you give me. OK, so how do I do it? Well, so let's look on a simpler problem. So let me look on the polytope of all x in R. K is the number of values. K plus 1, I think I need here. Let's see. So I'm looking at y. Let me keep it y here. Set of all non-negative real vector. Let's look on this polytope. So that uh, y0 minus the sum of those equals 0, and the sum of the a k equals 1. Let's see. Let's see if this is what I want, and then we'll explain this. Yes, let's look on this polytope. So this is the only demonstration of this, the power of this universality theorem I'm going to show you. So you see the polytope k plus 1 variables. y1 to yn corresponds somehow to these numbers, these given numbers. You give me these numbers. There's one equation. This is the extra variable y0. And non-negativity, and also the sum to 1. So now look on the integer points in this polytope. What are the integer points? So, well, what is the value that, so, so an integer point, you see they are non-negative, they sum to 1. So what can you say about the yi's here? Exactly 1 is 1 and the others are 0. So any integer point in this polytope has exactly y, some yi equals to 1, and the others are 0. So suppose it's some yi. Then what happens with these equations? This equation y0 becomes exactly si times 1 plus 0, so it's s1. So, so the set of integer points consists exactly of all the values, so y0 always gets one of these values. So y, yeah, so contains exactly k plus 1 points, integer points, k, sorry, k points, and y0 attains precisely the values S1 for SK. So this is trivial. You see, this is a trivial encoding of this situation or the gap situation. 
Uh, this example, okay. So this is trivial encoding, very simply. You know, you just play a little bit and you see how to, how to do it. But now I apply this universality theorem. So lift it to tables by using a universality. And I mean, I did not tell you how to prove this, uh, this theorem, but you lift it up and then you get a polytope of tables, you get lines and you get all the data you need. And then this Y0 entry is embedded in some entry, let's say X111, you can permute coordinates. So you can encode the situation in tables in this way. And if you apply this construction with uh, S10 and S2 equals S1, S2 equals to 2, and you do this, you get exactly these green numbers over there. That's how we, that's how we got them. It's very hard to guess it uh, without this machinery. So you actually apply this and you get these numbers and you get a gap or whatever you want. And so this universality theorem is, 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 is a useful thing. In particular, it tells you something about rational polytopes versus real polytopes. It is known that there are polytopes, convex polytopes, which can be re realized with real valued vertices, but are not integer, are not rational. It is known. There are examples of polytopes in dimension, starting in dimension, I don't remember, maybe seven or something that you can actually write down real numbers for the coordinates of the vertices, and there is no way you can realize it as a rational polytope. And there are very, kind of, well, there's a whole theory there. And, and this theorem now tells you that if you want to do something just for rational polytopes, there are questions on diameter and other questions, you can use this, this canonical presentation. Okay, so that's universality. So let me show you, move to the universality of n-fold, which is our topic here. So I discuss this. Oops, I'm going backwards. Oh, universality. <clears throat> okay, so I want to talk about universality of n-fold programs. I promised you that n-fold uh, systems are universal also in some sense. So every integer program <clears throat> is an n-fold program. So th this is the next uh, issue. Universality of n-fold integer programming. So let's look on this specific uh, specialization of the n-fold operator. I mean, are you following it somehow? Maybe after lunch, I don't know. <laughs> I feel a little bit like uh, disconnected from somehow. <laughs> uh, so you remember the n-fold, well, I know, you know, it's very hard to, uh, we are covering the whole book in, in seven lectures here over a week. It's very hard to, 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 to keep following all the definition from lecture to lecture, but let me, I hope you can still. So the usual n-fold operator I denoted by A, uh, round brackets n. And let's look on this specific one now, uh, square brackets n. And now I, I operate on a matrix, not on a bimatrix, but on a matrix. And the way we do it, we put the matrix here as the second block. And on top of it, we put the identity matrix as the first block. And actually, this already occurred in the previous talk. Uh, you remember multi-commodity flows. There, this A was this D, the incidence matrix of a graph. And uh, so we do this with identity. And then we do the end for the usual end for thing. And I call this this bracket end for product. This is a very useful thing. And in particular, we are always going to look on end for products of this form of a fixed small matrix, one, one, one. Can you guess why one, 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 one? It's related to the tables. That's the corner we want, right? What? Is that the corner with the tables? And not, not really. The sums of the rows. Well, I mean, eventually this is, yeah, I mean, you, maybe that's what you mean. I mean. Eventually it's going to give us the equations like here, this equation, and this is going to be the matrix of equation. Yeah, so you, you are, you are there. Why, why, why three? I mean, why, not the three, three. Why three here? Because yeah. I add the universality for three by m by n tables. So that's the three from the three by m table is going to be this three. Now, if I just look on, so m is going to be variable and also n, there's going to be also an n, but 3 is always fixed. We can actually put here 
L1s, and then this will give us L by M by N table. But it's an absolute on 3 for universality. So 3, and here's an example of this operator. I take the three products, then I take this 1, 1, 1, and copy it three times like this, and I put the 3 by 3 identity on top of it. So this is now the by matrix, and I copy it here. And as you see, this one is always the incidence matrix of the bipartite graph. Uh, uh, so 1, 1, 1, 1 to the M. is the incidence matrix of the complete bipartite graph on three vertices on one side and M on the other. So this is a zero one matrix. It's an undirected graph. So not zero plus minus one, zero one. On each column you have exactly two ones. Uh, you see it here, yeah. So now we are going to look on what? Any question? So now I'm going to iterate this. And I'm going to look on 1, 1, 1, always 1, 1, 1. This is the 3. Take the m, prod, n, m fold product of this kind and take the n fold product of this kind of this one. So the n-fold product of the n-fold product of 1, 1, 1, 1. <laughs> and now the claim is that if you look on uh, this system of equation, integer points, let's say, or real point, doesn't matter, non-negativity, and these equations, and the system of equations now, this is the right-hand side. And this, this is a matrix. It's a big matrix. Maybe I should actually write it. Uh, Hmm? <laughs> let's do it, uh, let's try 2, 2, I don't know, 2, 2. Let's try to do 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 2. Is it on the sheets? What? Is it on the sheets of the answer? Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> Good question. Let's see. So the first one is not so hard. The first one you do, let's see, uh, let's try, try small. So 1, 1, 1. I'm doing the first one first, okay? 1, 1, 1, 2. So what should I do? Put the identity, right? And do it twice. So one, 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 one. This is now my n. Now I have to do the two twofold product operator on this. So what does this mean? Uh, where is the eraser? <laughs> All right, you are right. I mean, it's not going to fit so easily. At least you can squeeze it. Yeah. So what should we do? Tell me what to do now. Identity. identity on top of that, right? So identity of size. What is it? Six by six. One. Two, three, four, five, six. Here. And now we do the second uh, twofold product of that. And this we again copy here. No, no, zero. No, no, zero. zero. Yeah, 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 all right. This goes down. You see, even. So I'm getting confused also. One, good. So you got it. <laughs> <laughs> like this. This, zero, zero, that's very good. And in general, the size is going to be, well, you can compute it. Uh, what's going to be the size of this matrix? Well, here is going to be 3MN, always. And here, it's a little bit harder to compute. Well, what is it? Uh, M, uh, 3M, well, it doesn't matter. I mean, you can compute it. The number of rows, I mean. The number of columns is 3 by 3MN. So you see, you get a really large matrix here, indeed. But the thing is, if you now take this as a matrix and you write your tables, so you write your vectors of tables suitably, so x1 up to xn, and each one of those guys is an ij between you know 1 and 3 and 1 and m or something like that. This encodes precisely this system of uh, lines and equations for 3 by m by n tables. And if you replace the 3 by L, uh, then you simply have to take, instead of 1, 1, 1, take L times 1. But you see, this is a much nicer way to, 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 to express this universality. And the point is, your matrix depends only on two parameters, m and n. And the universality tells you the following. You start with any polytope, rational polytope defined by a matrix B, 
and the right hand side b, that's all the data. And then actually there's a polynomial time algorithm which takes this matrix b, this vector b, produces m and n, and this long right hand side, so that there's a bijection between the rational points and the real points and the integer points between these two. And the bijection is actually very nice in the sense that simply if you take the bigger one, the table, then some entries correspond to the original one. And if you simply erase the others, you are left with the original one. So it's really a simple uh, projection back. And now let me tell you what does this mean about going back to optimization. So let me explain this. <clears throat> so here, oh, okay, so, yeah, so let's, let's look on, on a general scheme for, uh, for uh, <clears throat> arbitrary nonlinear integer programming. Yeah. Good. So well, I'm, not, I'm not going to repeat this joke, but I still wonder what is this wire for. So yeah. OK, so let's look here. So you see, so now consider this integer programming problem. This is a universal integer programming problem if you want to actually, uh, so, so OK. So suppose you start with an arbitrary integer programming problem in this standard form, equations, non-negativity, integrality, and some objective function, which we want to minimize or maximize. Then we have the following scheme. We can lift it up to such a, a, a more structured, perhaps, integer program where we have more variables, integer, non-negative, right-hand side equations. The same objective function, I mean, the objective function simply forgets about the other coordinates. So it simply works only those coordinates that come from the y's. So that's easy. And if you have an oracle, comparison oracle or whatever, it goes immediately to here. That's not a problem. And the matrix now defined it becomes this one, which is just depends on two numbers, m and n. And more than that, if m is fixed, you see it's blue. So whenever you fix m and you let only n vary, then what, what is it? It's an n-fold integer program, and you can solve it in polynomial time for every fixed m. So for every fixed m, every integer program that falls into this, uh, into this class with a fixed m, we can solve in polynomial time using uh, n-fold integer programming. And this includes many uh, natural problems in variable dimension. For example, tables, 3 by m by n tables, let's say and the variable number of variables. Uh, but if you let m vary, you get all integer programs. So this is NP-hard, right? So this, is a, this provides you, so I want to emphasize it, in the beginning of the talks, in the, lecture, the first lecture, I said that the most uh, natural or one that comes immediately to mind, parameterization, of integer programming is to fix the dimension, the number of variables. You fix it, you get fixed dimension, fixed number of variables, and then Lenz's algorithm, rational function, you can do it in polynomial time for every fixed D. And every integer program is one of those. But this gives you a different parameterization, a new different parameterization where the parameter is M. Any integer program fall into one of those if some fixed M. But whenever you fix M, you can solve it in polynomial time, it includes problems like table problem which has large number, variable number of variables. Uh, so let me conclude by some heuristic uh, here that follows this line. So I want to uh, f uh, uh, finish by some scheme again. I actually I mentioned this Graver, -fold, Graver approximation scheme yesterday. You remember this? A Graver approximation scheme of approximating the Graver basis. So we can do the same here. A little bit more, so if you, oh, that's exactly the end of the slides here. So let me tell you what I mean by using this scheme and, 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 and finding a graver approximation scheme for this, and this will end the talk of today. So where is the eraser?
So let me just call this uh, universal graver approximation scheme. for linear and various nonlinear programs, whatever we can do, in particular linear programs, linear integer programming. <coughs> so let's define G M N K to be the set. So to solve this problem using our methods, what do we need? If we want to apply chapter three, you know, to solve this system, what do we need? If we want to solve an integer program. We have a defining matrix. What do we do with this matrix? Compute the Gaber basis. We need the Gaber basis. The problem, of course, if M is fixed, this is an n-fold product of this matrix, right? And we can compute the Gaber basis in polynomial time. But if m is variable, we cannot. And even if n is, m is fixed, then it's going to be very large usually. n to the 9 or n to the 27, it becomes large very, very fast. So let's look on approximation as we have done before. And let's look on all element in the graver basis of 1, 1, 1, m, n, this is what I need, such that, so how are we going to restrict ourselves? Type. Exactly, of type which is restricted. Type x less than or equal to k. So for every m n, we are going to have a fixed uh, approximation. And as before, we are going to get a sequence now. Uh, well, this is the true Gaber basis somehow. And now, so here is the main point here. And again, there's a whole section on this in the monograph which explains this. Uh, and I think this really has some hopes for practically being a good, uh, a good heuristic for general integer programming. Uh, <clears throat> so what is the idea now? So for every, the problem, let me explain what is the problem. So tables and some other applications like multi-commodity flows uh, indeed fit naturally here with a fixed M maybe. Because they immediately come with a fixed M. Tables, for example, table with one side long. But if you take your arbitrary integer program, Mean problem coming from some application, you know, usually m is not going to be fixed. When you apply the universality, both n and m are going to be variable. And so this is a problem. But now, suppose we fix this approximation, let's say 3. So let's fix some k. Fix any k. And consider. This approximation, GMNK, for your program. Then, so let me be careful a little bit here. And that's where we're probably going to end soon with this. But let me make this precise and careful. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So, yeah, the punchline is coming soon. So, uh, so GK, GM and K, well, 
This is something that, again, we've done before. How do we get it? This is the, the set of all elements in the Gaber base of type K. This comes as the n liftings of things in the corresponding thing, right? So this is exactly the set of all x, which is x n n lifting of some element of the greater basis of 1, 1, 1, m, n. So now, now think about this m is fixed, and this is my matrix, 1, 1, 1, m. And I want to compute the n-fold product. So the type k is going to come from n liftings of those of k-fold product. So this case approximation of the, this universal Gobner basis, a, a greater basis, is a, the set of all liftings of some elements of the k full product of the n full product of 1, 1, 1, 1. And now here comes the observation that uh, the greater basis of 1, 1, 1, 1 mk is isomorphic under some permutation. Can you guess? I, I, I want it to be visible, so let me write it down. So this is isomorphic. So the greater basis of 1, 1, 1, 1, something. So what should go up here now? Hmm? KM, exactly, because think about tables. So I mean, you may have lost me, but think about tables. These are 3 by M by K tables. If you permute the axis of the tables, nothing changes. So you can permute the M and the K. So exactly as you said, it's exactly like this. And so here's, here's come the thing. You take your integer program, you lift it, you get some M and N. They are variable, you have no control of this, unless you come from some application like tables. But now you want to do the approximation at level 3, let's say. You compute this greater basis. Can you compute this greater basis? Can you see this or this uh, is blocking it for you? I'm uh, blocking it. That's very important. So let me take one more minute and copy it up here. So G, let me do it once and for all here, and then we are almost done. Is the set of all n liftings of elements in G one 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 uh, M K and G one 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 M K is isomorphic to G K M. And now the point is the following. If I fix K, let's say K equals to 3, then this becomes a fixed by matrix, and this is the m-fold product of this. So I can compute this in polynomial time using the m-fold operator. And now I just have to permute the coordinate to get it back to down to this. I do the n liftings, and I get the case approximation of the, this universal Grobner basis, Graver basis, so <laughs> our connections to Grobner basis, but we are not going to discuss them. <laughs> it's not a coincidence. And what is the number, what is the size of this uh, element, of this Graver basis? The cardinality of this is well, the n lifting. Let's look on the n lifting. So the n lifting give us what? N choose, n choose what? Well, actually, let me start from here, and I, I want to be careful here, not to get confused. So uh, it's going to be well. Well, you can work it out. Roughly, it's going to be. So it's roughly order n to the k. M to the G of one 
is greater complexity of this matrix, roughly. I mean, uh, you know, and it may not be 100% accurate here, but uh, actually, I, I, what I'm, I'm pretty sure I can write here. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, OK. 1, 1, 1, 1, K. And I should also say the G, 1, 1, 1, K, is what I define to be the greater complexity of the complete bipartite graph 3 by K. So, okay, to summarize, so to summarize this whole discussion, whenever you want to use an approximation for your gravel basis, you have your, any integer program, you lift it up using this universality. This is all very, of course, expensive. It's time consuming, but everything I'm describing now is polynomial time. <clears throat> you lift it up, you get some M and N, and now you fix some approximation because generally the problem is empty hard. So let's say k equals 3. This is already very interesting and promising. And now you go and do this construction here. And the time which is needed is n to the k, let's say 3, n cubed times m to the greater complexity of the bipartite graph k, 3, k. So for k equals 3, we said this is 9. So for k equals 3, the third approximation, which, as I'm saying, seems to be very useful, so the third universal greater approximation or greater set has size, cardinality, order n cubed n to the 9. So in this polynomial time, you can construct the third approximation and use it to, for your iterative augmentations and see what you get. And uh, some experience we've been doing seems that you always get to the, well, you can always find feasibility, for example. And, uh, well, there's a whole room of studying really what these approximations mean. And actually somebody earlier uh, mentioned some average case analysis. So, well, give me a push there. So, average case analysis, uh, if you know the simplex method for linear programming, there's a method called the simplex method. It runs very fast in practice for years before there were polynomial time algorithms. Still, it's a very good... Uh, algorithm in practice. You give it a linear program, it's a combinatorial algorithm, finds the optimal solution very fast. But sometimes it can get stuck. Unfortunately, today there are uh, polynomial time algorithms, interior point method, ellipsoid method, and so on. But uh, there's a whole work, there's a book by Borgart, which describes the behavior of the simplex method under assumptions that the data come from uh, some random uh, reasonable, there's some reasonable distribution on the input, on the data. I mean, you asked about this before. And the whole book, very nice analysis, and it shows that the expected running time of the simplex under this distribution of the data is actually polynomial. And these methods are actually iterative and somehow reminds of the simplex method, and there may be some hope it's going to be a very hard project. But there's a hope that maybe one can show that under suitable assumption on random data, you can show that uh, something, you know, that you get good convergence or something like that. So, so in the, my last talk tomorrow will be again on the blackboard, I think. And I'm going to go back to chapter two. And chapter two is, is geometry, so no more graver bases, and just the end, I mean, I'll mention them again. So if you got tired of graver bases, uh, We'll do some drawings, polytopes, and so on. So it's a geometric thing. We are going to talk about convex maximization, chapter two. And last remark that I wanted to say is, ah, yeah, the greater basis. So I, I kept saying Grobner basis now and then. So this is not a coincidence. There's a connection. And the greater basis are actually uh, from what's called universal Grobner basis for certain ideals, so-called toric ideals. So, but, so there's a connection, but it's outside of the scope of this. Again, I, in, in, in the monograph, I discussed this as an application 
in the last chapter. Okay, so let's stop here.